It gives you that freedom is what it does to finally say, eh, you know, it's back to that normal thing of like, um, you know, when before you drink and you're addicted to it or that your brain said you had to have it, that you could go, oh, it's just like, you know, eating dessert. You know, I have it every so often. It's a treat, that type thing. The thing I'm dealing with now is sometimes, you know, when you go out um, like to a party or to get together with friends, I really have to watch it because you get to talking, you get to having a good time. And next thing you know, I say, I'm only going to have two drinks. Well, you really have to watch it. Or like you, you, one thing you, you told me that last time I talked to you, I think it was in March, I was going to see my daughter for her birthday. And you said a drink and then a diet Coke in between or water. I was the only sober one that night. <laughs> All right. So we can go ahead and kick things off. Um, I want to start by welcoming everyone to a Sinclair Method success story interview. My name is Katie Lane. For those who don't know me with Thrive Alcohol Recovery, I'm a success story of the Sinclair Method and have become a diehard advocate since it freed me of my own struggles with alcohol. And today I have with me Kristen, who is also a success story of the Sinclair Method and has been generous enough to uh, take some time out of her day to share her TSM success story and testimony. We've been kind of chatting on and off for a while and you know kind of been in touch somewhat over the last year or so of your Sinclair Method journey so just want to start Kristen by first of all thanking you for taking time to share your story with us well, thank you I appreciate it everything you do Oh, well, okay. So I was telling you before we hit record that people always tell me how much they love these Sinclair Method testimonies and success stories because they get a glimpse into what someone else went through on this journey. Because for a lot of people, the journey is not perfect. There's ups and downs, uh, but having an idea of you know where you started and where you are now can be a really um, big uh, motivational and inspirational uh, factor in someone's journey. So do you mind if we just start with you telling us a bit about you know your history with alcohol and what it is that led you to the Sinclair Method? Okay, well, you know, I didn't drink in high school. My parents said, if you want alcohol, you're going to drink it right in front of us. And so I was like, that's no fun. Um, didn't drink in high school, didn't really drink till I was 21 and didn't have a problem. I have had two grown children. You know, I didn't drink a drop of alcohol the entire time I was pregnant. And in fact, with my second daughter, we call her my sweet surprise. I had been out to dinner two weeks before and had two glasses of wine at dinner, which was like, you know, more than I ever had in two weeks. And I found I was pregnant and I'm at the doctor's crying going, oh my gosh, I had two glasses of wine two weeks ago and I didn't know I was pregnant. And they're like, okay, get over it. That's not going to hurt the baby. I mean, that's how it just wasn't a problem for me. But I guess about in my thirties, it got to where it was like a coping mechanism. My father got really, really ill. I was up and down the road. I live in Georgia. I had smaller kids um, up and down the road between there and St. Louis, um, you know, just balancing life, kids that are getting older, a husband who has a high stress job. And it got to where it was coping and it was more of a habit. I didn't crave it, but the habit slowly over time turned into, I can't put this down. You know, it was like, it's five o'clock. Can you get out of my house? So I have a glass of wine. And you know, like one glass led to the two, to the three. And you know, it just, you know, over and over and over, same thing. So I guess it was about um, I, 2011, 2012, um, and that was probably, in, oh gosh, it would have been in my 40s, actually. Um, I realized I had an issue. So, you know, back then, the only thing you knew is, oh, go to AA. Go to AA. So I went to AA, and please, I'm not bashing AA in any way, shape, or form. I saw success stories that worked for people, and it was awesome for them. It made me crazy. It made me crazy. Because all I would do is walk out there going, I'm a flawed individual. I'm flawed spiritually. I'm flawed, flawed this and that. And, and that's another thing. I'm very rooted in my faith as far as um, my, Christi my Christianity and my faith. So I would think, oh, my gosh, I, you know, that's that conflict with, yes, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm not, but, you know, I've been, you know, God's forgiven me for that. But yet I feel like I'm spiritually flawed. I'm morally flawed. And it just spiraled. It got worse. It got worse. Um, I tried to go back there and it just, it was not for me. It was just not for me because all I did was think about don't drink, don't drink, don't drink, don't drink. And, you know, it's like a little kid. You tell them not to do something. What are they going to do? Let's go do it. So. Um, and then I guess it was in 2012, I'd gone to a counselor. It was not a different one mine. Short, long story short. And he said, have you heard of the Sinclair method? And I said, no. He goes, okay, well, um, go look it up on the computer and go back to AA and get a sponsor. Okay. Well, you know, that doesn't exactly work that way. So, um, <laughs> I said, okay. So I look it up online. I thought you can't go get a counselor, you know, you know, a sponsor and still drink in AA. They'll look at you and go, no, you're out of here. So um, back then in 2012, all they had was um, basically, I think it was the, the one forum, um, it's called um, Option Save Lives now, I think is what it's called. 
So I would blog back and forth on that. And from 2012 to 2015, I was compliant. I mean, 100% compliant. And for some reason in 2015, I was on a cruise and I thought, I don't think I'm going to take my, my um, medicine. Well, you know how that goes. It goes okay for a while and then it just goes downhill. So, you know, I think a lot of it had to do with the one little resource sources out there. A lot of things that could say, you know, groups you could talk to and say, yeah, it works. Stay on it. Stay on it. Stay on it. Well, I learned that real quickly that it didn't work. And, you know, then we went to the COVID lockdown. And um, I told my husband, I said, um, how much of this Costco bill is food and how much is alcohol that you're bringing in here? But my husband, he doesn't have a drinking problem in any way, shape or form. You know, he can love it or leave it. Um, but we were home with basically two grown kids that came back, um, my son. And my son decided he's going to join the Navy. Well, my stress level just went right through the roof. So um, anyway, I realized then that it was time to go back on it. And that's when I said, okay, well, I still had the medication. And I started it back. I've been, um, as of April, this year will be two years that I'm compliant. Um, you know, I hear people that, they, you know, after three months there, they consider themselves, you know, cured or whatever. Um, six months. I'm a slower responder. Um, mine has been pretty much, it's, you see the gradual things, you know, where the curve and um, I don't really do computer graphs well. So I have the written curve, you know, on the, on the graph paper that I drug out from somewhere I had left over and would graph it. And I noticed it's gone down, you know, slowly, slowly and the alcohol free days would start coming and start coming and start coming every other day, two days in a row. Now it's to the point to where it's like, Oh my gosh. Okay. Now this weekend we had a party to go to. My husband and I went to dinner Friday night. I had, um, you know, I drank while I was out. Um, but you know, Sunday came around and I'm like, you know, Oh, it's eight o'clock. I didn't even drink. It's nine o'clock the next day. I didn't even drink. You know, now we're going on day four and I'm like, my mom says she's going to take us to dinner tonight. I'm thinking, I really don't want to have anything to drink because I need to get home and finish packing. Cause we're going to go see our son in Norfolk. He's stationed, stationed up there. So is it, it can say, eh, you know, it's back to that normal thing of like, um, you know, when before you drink and you were addicted to it or that your brain said you had to have it, that you could go, oh, it's just like, it, you know, eating dessert. You know, I have it every so often. It's a treat, that type thing. The thing I'm dealing with now is sometimes, you know, when you go out um, like to a party or to get together with friends, I really have to watch it because you get to talking, and you get to having a good time. And next thing you know, I say, I'm only going to have two drinks. Well, you really have to watch it. Or like you, you, one thing you, you told me that last time I talked to you, I think it was in March, I was going to see my daughter for her birthday. And you said a drink and then a diet Coke in between or water. I was the only sober one that night. <laughs> well, my daughter was too, actually, <laughs> but her friends weren't. So, you know, it's just things like that. That's what it gives you that freedom to unwind your brain because that's what your brain keeps saying. You got to have it. You know, it totally, alcohol totally rewires your brain. It, 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 it says you have to have it like you have to have food and water and shelter. It thinks you have to have it to survive. And I remember that first time in AA that um, they said, go without drinking. I made it to day five and I thought, I'm going to rip this house apart if I don't find something. I really am. And I don't have that anymore. It's just like, you know, I can turn the TV on or read a book and go to bed and not even think about having something, which is awesome. Awesome. Oh my gosh. Yes. And you touched on so many different aspects of what many people go through on the Sinclair method as far as challenges with compliance, you know, feeling like you are more of a gradual or slower responder. And then the challenges with the habit piece and how easy it is to potentially drink through the naltrexone and not mm -hmm. to mention your background with trying AA or abstinence-based programs, which I too, I will never bash it. My dad is sober from AA. It's great yeah. for some people, but I think you know, like the option saves lives slogan is it's like, okay, if that's not working for you, what's what's the alternative? And for a lot of people, the Sinclair method is that alternative. Um, so interesting also, Kristen, that you didn't have a problem for like the majority of your early mm -mm. adult life. It's something that came on later as a coping tool, it sounds like. It was in my 40s. Uh, you know, I started I started seeing the you know, drinking more in my late 30s, um, mid 40s to I'm in my mid 50s now is when it just, you know, I saw that, you know, like I said, it got to where it was out of control. I knew went on the Sinclair method. It, then it wasn't bad when I went off of it like an idiot. I will say that like an idiot. I went off of it, um, you know, because then you got to start all over again. And but yeah, you know, I'm in mid 50s. And now I'm thinking, you know, that's what I got so, so stressed about or upset about. I'd say I never had a problem. I never have a problem. But, you know, it, it you can start a habit anytime, anytime. You know, what is it? What is it? So many days to make a habit and so many days to break a habit, that yeah. type thing. And it's true. So true. It's it, would you say that it like snuck up on you when oh, it was yeah. something? Okay, so, so can you talk about that? Like, when did what was that experience of it being like a normal, you know, you enjoy drinking and then it became more of the alcohol use disorder territory? Um, the normal alcohol drinking would probably be like if I went out to dinner and had a glass of wine, 
if I had two, that was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I had two glasses of wine type thing. Um, you know, I was never the type to drink under the influence. Uh, I never put my children in danger. Or I would never, you know, that type of thing. And, you know, and then it got to where, okay, I'm going to bring a bottle of wine home. And, you know, go to the grocery store and bring it home. Well, now it's got to where every time I go to the grocery store, I make sure there's one that comes home with me. And I remember when I thought this is out of control, I was one afternoon, it was about two in the afternoon, I'm thinking, I want a drink. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's gone from the five o'clock, you know, the Southern five o'clock drink that you have to the two o'clock, oh my gosh, I want something. And it's either going to be vodka or wine, you know, and I'm thinking, this is not right. This is not right. I got to get my kids home from school. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And that's when I went, I got a problem. If that makes sense. It was just such a gradual, gradual thing. And like I said, for me, it was just, you know, like from having something at dinner to keeping it in the house and making sure it was in the house just in case and hiding it. You know, right now, if for some reason we did open a bottle of wine at home for a special occasion, it's out there on the counter. I'm not going to hide it from you. Did you have a glass of wine like last night? Yes, I did. You know, yeah, I'm not going to hide it, but I had some really good hiding places. I really did. <laughs> Can we talk about that too real quick? Because a lot of people struggle with the hiding piece, myself included. And yeah. even going on the Sinclair method, there's this like transition period of like, okay, I can't sneak it anymore. But even sneaking it is like a habit in and of itself because you yes. get this like rush from like sneaking it. Can you oh, talk yeah. about that and how you maybe transition from being hiding, from being someone who hid their alcohol to now drinking in the open? Exactly. Well, you know, even like my friends that I told them, I said, you know, I'm, my really close friends, I know that I've done this. Um, and I had one friend that she's, she's so Southern. I love her. She said, you don't have a drinking problem. If I thought you had a drinking problem, I'd be on you like white on rice. And I went, what? White on rice. And I went, okay, yeah, well, rice is white, I guess. You know, I never heard of that one. But she, you know, and, and my friends, I said, well, I said, I guess because I'm a little bit, you know, I talk real fast and I'm, I'm kind of a little bit goofy anyway. It, you really couldn't tell when I'd had too much, I guess it was. Um, and I would do things like at a party, you know, they didn't always see how many times you'd pour it into the, you know, into the glass. Pre-game, pre-gaming was a big thing. Pre-game, okay, we're going to have this thing that we have to go to at seven. Okay, I'd have like a two huge, well, healthy glasses down before I'd even be there and be pre-game, brush my teeth, throw some mints in, nobody knew the difference type thing. Um I have a cabinet that, that actually, I don't know if they never finished it out, but you could like put a bottle and shove it around the corner and nobody would really see it. Um, wine was my big thing. And then it went in vodka was another thing. Um, uh, you know, hiding, I think I saw a video one time that you talked about hiding the vodka bottle in a seat and every so often taking a drag off of it. Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, you know, the whole thing. Um, that type of thing, you know, it was like a social thing. Everybody was out or we'd be like at one time we were in Napa in California and everybody's out drinking wine. Well, nobody knows the difference. I'm not driving. Nobody's driving. It doesn't matter. And next thing you know, well, I'm not drinking the wine. I'm drinking something else. It was just that kind of thing, um, being able to hide it. Um, big purses, you can hide a lot in a big purse. You really can, you know, and nobody's going to go through your purse. And if you, you just go to the bathroom or wherever and, and you know, that type of thing. Um, that's just, you know, that it is, it's very easy to hide. Yeah. You know, and a lot of things, especially when you're, you know, you're raising two kids and your husband's got a busy job and you're in, no one's going to notice, you know, as long as you get everything done at night and the kids taken care of and the house clean. And I was really good at cleaning the house when I'd had too much to drink. My house was really clean. <laughs> it's not clean now. <laughs> I do miss that. But, you know, when you're just, you're, you're in the, the thing of raising kids and it's crazy schedule, no one's going to notice. No one's really going to notice yeah. type thing when you're in home. Because the kids are in bed, the laundry's done, um, the backpacks are packed, the lunch are packed for tomorrow. And, you know, I, yeah, I always stayed up later with my husband because he had to go to work the next day. Yeah. Even though I had to get up the kids and everything. And I thought it was the worst thing was getting up sometimes and hiding the fact that you felt like someone had run over you with a truck. But you smiled and you went on. That's what you did. You know, and you wow. drive down the road thinking, I wonder if anybody else feels like this. You know, is this normal? Yeah. You are preaching like I am just like <laughs> nodding my head over here like you are so spot on. Yes, this is like, I mean, I don't have kids, but the struggles of AUD and just wondering if everyone else feels hungover. Who else wants yeah. to drink at two in the afternoon? Or am I the only one? Exactly. Uh, wow. And so like for me, the hiding had become my own little game. I don't know if you felt like that. It was just yes. like, ooh, how can I, like, where's the new clever spot I can hide it? And, you know, when you sneak it and they're not paying attention, you just feel like you win something. So it's oh, yeah. it's such a bizarre thing. Was it was it hard for you to break that habit of hiding? I'm curious. I don't know. I think, you know, the older I got, um, you're a lot younger than me. When you, when you hit your 50s, you really don't care anymore. Okay. <laughs> it's like, this is me. <laughs> this is yeah. as good as it okay. gets. 
if you don't like it, I'm so sorry. You know, and that's my thing. I thought, you know, I'm just tired of lying to myself and lying to everybody else. Of course, now, you know, I don't hide it because if I'm going to drink it, it's just going to be right there. Now, my husband has a bourbon collection. He's from Kentucky. It's where he's from. So he has this bourbon collection downstairs. I don't even touch that. You know, that was never anything that I even touched. But, you know, earlier on, I tried to sneak from that. But he knew it because you didn't touch the good stuff. You know, that was his collection. And it is. It's a collection. It's what it is. And, you know, I would try to sneak from that. And he'd go, who drank this? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, it wasn't the dog. <laughs> you know, come on. <laughs> so... Yeah, just little things like that. And, you know, the lying, the lying is the, the worst part because I would just hate myself because, you know, when you normally stuff I would never lie about, when you're drinking, you just say anything because you don't want to get in trouble. Once again, it's like your little kid. You don't want to get in trouble. Yeah. You don't want to get caught. You don't want to get caught. Yes, it's so true. And someone was just talking to me about this, about how the drinking causes us to be so out of integrity with who yes. we really are. And we don't want that, but it really wears on us. Like even just the lie of like, oh, I don't know who drank your alcohol or, you know, my husband would ask me, oh, like, how are you so drunk? You only had two drinks. And meanwhile, Bingo. I was like sipping over here. I'm like, I don't know. I guess I forgot to eat, but it was. That's it. Now husband go, did you not eat? And I'm like, <laughs> must have been <laughs> silly yeah. me. Yeah. And that's another thing. When I would drink, I would eat. Now, I'm probably the heaviest, but I've lost some weight, but that's another thing is the weight. And you know, when you go to the doctor and they do your blood work, I started to see the levels a little bit higher, a little bit higher. And I thought, no, my father died from NASH, which is non-alcoholic cirrhosis of the liver and kidney failure is what he died from. He was a not, he wasn't an alcoholic, you know, it's non-alcoholic. And I watched him for years, three years, just go downhill, downhill until basically he was just a shell, you know, and I thought, I'm not doing that to my children. I am not doing that to my children. That was another thing. Cause even though his was non-alcoholic, I could see what if I do develop, you know, problems with my liver because of alcohol, I, you know, I'm not only hurting myself, but you know, a, a child watching their parent die is a horrible thing. It really is when it could have been prevented, when it could have been prevented. Yes. I mean, not to get all, you know, kind of gloom and doom, but that's, you know, that's part of it. It really blood. is. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, you know, before the Sinclair method, those things would always instill fear in me and it would give me a reality check, but I was still battling the craving. I don't know about you, but yes. like, okay, yeah, I know I'm damaging my health, but I want to drink more right now. So I'm just going to kind of ignore that. But it, it does become a bigger thing. And it with the Sinclair method, we can have that healthy fear of the consequences of it, but we're not having to fight the craving all the time. We can see ourselves change and fix our drinking so that it gets to a point where it's not risky anymore. Exactly. Exactly. And that's one thing I like about the simpler method. Like the counselor that I saw, um, lady I've seen for years off and on, um, she's had a couple of patients call me about this. And I had one lady say, well, I just don't want to stop drinking altogether. I said, you don't have to, but you can drink within healthy limits. You can get to that point where you drink within healthy limits, where you had the option of drinking or not drinking and how much you drink that thing, you know, that type thing. And that's what's so wonderful about this because, you know, it's moderation in everything, food, drink, you know, uh, you know, I don't exercise, so I wouldn't say that, but you know. <laughs> one day moderation there too. Exactly. Moderation. I don't want to hurt myself. I might pull something, you know? <laughs> oh, that's so, so funny. You know, I love your sense of humor. <laughs> you have to laugh for us. What was it? I was choking one day. It was, um, I, I was saying about Jimmy Buffett. I said, the Reverend Jimmy Buffett says, if we weren't all, if you weren't all crazy, we would have been saying, I said, yeah, that's so true. You have to just laugh. You really yep. do. Life is too short not to. Yep. It really is. It yep. really, really is. I know. I, I feel the same way too. And I try to bring humor to the alcohol use disorder problem. And I always wonder, I'm like, do people appreciate that? Is it too much? I don't know. But I, I do think it's, especially the longer we're on this journey and the better we get, we can start to laugh at ourselves more. And it's so you know, true. You have to. There's so you much shame, to. you know. Oh, there is. I remember just laying there in bed sometimes, waking up in the morning, going, oh gosh, and just crying and saying, Lord, I can't do this anymore. I just can't do this anymore. I mean, down on my knees saying, I can't do this anymore. But, you know, I, and I think I, Last time I talked to you, I talked about there's a, um, a verse in the Bible that says that God says, I will never tempt you past what that I can bring you through. And it's so true because um, I think he gives us these things because you can turn around and help other people. You become a better person for it. You find out who you are through all this. You find mm -hmm. out what you could be through all this and you find out what you don't want to be through all this. You it's really, so really do. And, you know, and I, I think it was also you that said in a video one time, you can't pray your way out of this. He gives you the tools. You got to use them. You got to use them. And there are those people I hear that say, you know, it was a miracle. It's like that. I was turned and I will never doubt that. But in my case, I couldn't pray my way out of this. Yeah. You know, I couldn't. It, it, yeah. I had to do the work. I had to do the work. And it is. It's work. Yeah. It's like anything. 
Yeah. And, and it's so interesting though, as far as like this being, I, I've heard from so many people who are believers who say that this, the Sinclair method has been their answer to prayer, which it is per, like mm-hmm. that. It is a God you know, thing. It's, it's incredible. And yeah, it's not, I know I actually have people reach out to me who were on TSM and then they were delivered from addiction and no longer needed it because of God. And I know that can happen. Yes. Um, and he also uses tools like, like this. And it's just incredible um, to, to see that and see testimonies like yours and others of people who are set free from it you know, outside of what we traditionally think is, you know, the AA is the way to Mm -hmm. go. But I've heard more believers and non-believers alike be turned away from AA because of the dogmatic spiritual nature of it, which I'm not even actually exactly sure what it is that they promote there. I think it's like anything can be for Uh, God and that's not your higher power. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not comfortable for atheists or believers. Yeah. He said that chair can be your higher power. And I thought, Hey, that's my chair. That chair's my higher power. I got a problem. Yeah, I'm screwed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so done. <laughs> oh, exactly. Funny. Yeah. So I want to go back for a second because you started on the Sinclair method originally in 2015. Is that right? Uh, 2012. Mm-hmm. 2012. So that's a long time a long ago. Time so ago. you were like, I mean, one of the original TSM people. So yes. you started on the treatment. Were you following it correctly? And, and what was it like in your first attempt at it? Um, I just did it because I thought, well, this could be my only hope, you know, this has to work. Um, it talked about, you know, the pharmaceutical extinction that made sense to me of rewiring your brain. You know, I read the book about, um, the cure for alcoholism, uh, Dr. Scapa, however you say, and, um, I, that was about all there was. And I found that forum online. That was it. And I would read what other people would say and talk about, but they'd say, just take the pill, sit back, let it do its magic. It's a lot more than that. It is, but you know, for some people, you know, that is part of it, but you do have to do the work, the mindful, you know, the mindful drinking, the mindful, you know, about everything, planning stuff and charting and everything. And that was one thing about that website um, that I did like that on the bottom, everybody would do a running tally of um, how many drinks they'd had that week or how many alcohol free days. So you could see the decline and see that it worked in other people and see that it worked in yourself. I'm a really bad person about the blogging. Um, I'm, I love like the one-on-ones, like the, um, the zoom meetings they have, because I could actually see like when you would talk and Bruce would talk and back and forth with other people that worked for me. It really did. Cause I'm really bad thinking I need to blog, but I also need to go do da 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 that type thing. So yeah, I started back in 2012 is what I started back wow. there and then 15 and then 15, I don't know why I went off of it. We were on a cruise. I remember the night thinking, I'm just not going to take it. I want to go back to the cabin. And then it was off and on, off and on, and then it was quit. And I could handle it, go for several days. And then eventually by about six months, it was back to where it was. Oh. And then it was back. I think, well, I just won't drink every day. Well, you know why? I was recovering on the second day. You know, you don't want to drink. You don't yes. you feel horrible. So that's why I think it just, you know, it hit me again during COVID. It was time. It was yeah. time. It really was. And my kids were home. And my daughter said something to me one time. She's getting ready to go back to college. And, you know, you think your kids don't really pay attention. But she said to me, she said, I don't want you drinking tonight. I need you to help me pack. And I went, oh, I mean, you stabbed me in the heart. I mean, I could, I, I, I cried. It just, it, that one, you know, and my son, uh, he went to the University of Alabama. I don't know if you think, know anything about Southern schools. Um, I think they should give everybody a six-month detox after you graduate for free. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, Roll Tide, the whole bit. Um, Alabama, they party, hardy, hardy. And I had a very serious talk with him about it. He does not have a craving issue. He does not, he's like I said, he's in the Navy now, but he said, mom, and he looked at me, he goes, mom, you don't have a problem. I said, yes, I do, baby. You just don't see it. But I was very upfront with him. I said, no, you're in a very high social situation and you had a fraternity. And I said, you need to watch it because, you know, I think a lot of it's genetic. I really do. I think you're wired that way. And I said, I'm going to be very upfront and very transparent with you. So thank you, Lord. Neither of my kids have an issue like that. They don't. But I mean, oh my gosh, those four years in Alabama, he, I think he majored in um, social life. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> he did it very well. Their, um, their motto is Alabama, where legends are made. Well, I think he made his own legend there. Let me tell you. <laughs> so funny. Yeah. And now he's like stark contrast in the Navy. <laughs> oh yeah. He, now he jumps out of helicopters 15 feet in the ocean. He's special ops is swimmer rescue, you know, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is not the same child that I thought if I could just get him graduated in four years, you know. <laughs> that's good yeah. though that's a good thing yes yeah. yeah so like yeah. it's interesting i want to go back to your challenges with compliance because sometimes we think with the sinclair method that compliance or lack of compliance i should say can stem from an issue of like oh i went through something really hard or oh i mm-hmm. just wanted to get drunk but it sounds like it was pretty like benign you're like oh i don't feel like going back to get my naltrexone i'll just drink with yeah. it like it wasn't really like a major issue right that caused no, you it, to go no- 
No, I don't know why I did it. I just don't know why. I don't, and there's no rhyme or reason. And even now, sometimes it's funny because you'll think, well, do I, you know, when you first start, oh, I got to wait an hour. Oh, I got to wait. And you would plan it. Okay. If I want to drink by this time, I have to drink by this. Now it's like, eh, I'm too lazy to go get it. So I'm just not going to drink at all. You know, <laughs> it's just amazing how it's just totally turned around, yes. you know, and I really don't want it. So I'm really not going to take it. Cause I think the only side effect I ever really had, um, this sounds weird, but when I first started taking it back in 2012, I would get facial pain. And they, I, I, I don't know if that was one of the side effects, but I'd take it and about 30 minutes later. I'd start getting, it was the weirdest thing. The only thing I have now when I do take it, I can get very grumpy. And, you know, because it is blocking the endorphins. And, you know, it's like, don't poke the bear. She just took her pill. Yeah, that type thing. That's the only thing I really have to watch it because I could, you know, you know, bite at somebody if they say something, the right thing. If, it, because it does. It, it blocks your happy feelings. Yes. And that's the only side effect I had from it. So, and I can see why somebody, if they had bad side effects of it, nausea and things like that, would have to work through it and maybe not want to stick with it. But it's one of those things I think if you do, it eventually will get to where the side effects are so small compared to the outcome on the end. Exactly. Yeah. No, it makes perfect sense. And I don't yeah. know if you saw the poll I did because I was, I had the irritability side effect too. And I was like, not everyone does though. I did a poll and I think about half people said they experienced it. So I totally know what you were feeling. When oh, you yeah. Feel that grumpy. It was crazy. But, but I like just don't you... know. Yeah. I just don't know why. I don't know why I quit it. It was just crazy. But I yeah. can think of maybe three times I wasn't compliant and I felt, oh, we can't ever do that again. Bad, bad. Don't do that again. And, you know, you just, you just don't. You get to where it becomes, it, I say it gets to where, like, I get up in the morning and I brush my teeth. That's just what I do. You know, when I glass one, I take my pill. That's, it's just routine. It's what yeah. you do. It becomes a new habit to take it before. Yeah. What, what, like, wisdom, what did you learn from that that you could share with others, maybe who are on the method so that maybe that doesn't happen to them? Um, you know, in the first, when you first start it, just plan it, um, say, okay, my normal drinking time is five o'clock. Um, just set your watch, set your phone, whatever, uh, four o'clock, ding, 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 it goes off. Or if you want to take an hour and a half before, sometimes I think, you know, when you first start, if you get a little bit more in your system or whatever, um, set your phone, set your clock, go off, just, just have it with you. I have those little things that I have it on my keychain that you can put the pills in. I have in my car, I have them here, I have them there. I, I found one in the bathroom the other day. I'm thinking I need to start cleaning again. You know, that type of thing. I just keep it with you at all times. Like you keep your keys with you in your purse, have it on the thing in your purse, a little pill. You can get them off of Amazon. You get like 10 of them for 10 bucks. That the top screws off. You can put like 10 pills in there. It's always with you. Um, always on your wallet. Um, guys, put it in your um, glove box, you know, since you don't carry a purse or if you carry a purse, I think it's called a purse, a man yeah. purse now, whatever it is, you know, um, but always have it with you the way you'd always have your keys or your wallet. Um, that's the big thing because in the beginning, um, just make sure that that this, you know, cause it's not habit in the beginning, yeah. you know, I could think, you know, I have medicine I take at night for like my allergies or something. I thought, oh, I didn't take that. Don't want to get out of bed and do that again. You know, but that's, this is something that has to be, you have to do. So keep it with you at all times especially in the beginning, set your clock, set your watch to whatever time, an hour, hour and a half before, take it. And then remember, get busy during that hour, an hour and a half, go clean the house, go do kit, go, um, go, um, go for a walk, go, um, start dinner. I don't know, give the dog a bath, anything just to keep your mind off of it. And you'd be surprised how fast that hour will go by. Yeah. It really will very quickly. Whereas now, you know, like I said, tonight, I'm thinking, you know, we're going out to dinner. If I do decide that I want to have a glass of wine with dinner, uh, we're going out about six thirty, five o'clock. I got it with me. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great advice. And it seems so simple, simple and practical, but it, if you don't have naltrexone on you and in the moment you're tempted, it's so easy to just be like, oh, yeah. oh, I'll skip it this time. And it can be such a slippery slope. And so I, I appreciate you sharing that advice. And even one time, it's amazing how that brain can just a little bit go, Ooh, that was kind of fun. You got okay. just a little bit of that spark of what you used to get because, and everybody says, well, what's the difference? I said, because when you drink, you get that, oh, that was fun, that euphoric feeling. I just get, okay, well, that tasted like gasoline. <laughs> you know, it's what I get, you know, type thing. And it's amazing how that white wine that I thought tasted so good, it does taste like gasoline. And here's another thing. If you think, do I want to drink or not? Take a big sniff of it first and go, oh my gosh, no, nope, I don't want to drink that. And where it used to be like, that was just second nature. You just put it back, you know, type thing. It's yeah. so true. And it's like someone called uh, naltrexone, like the greatest truth serum, I think. Oh and it gosh, is, yes. it, it lets you see alcohol for what it is. Because when we all first started drinking, or at least I can speak for myself, like I didn't love the taste. I didn't mm -hmm. love the effects. It was just like, oh, okay. But you acquire it because it's giving you all this pleasure and euphoria, but through naltrexone and you, you start to, you know, take, you take your power back over it because it's you not do. 
blasting your brain with endorphins. And so um, it's so true. You know, I, I actually like to drink more on naltrexone because I had control. Like, I just feel like my brain would just like take on a mind of its own when I was drinking without it. Oh, yeah. I didn't trust myself, but it's like, oh, to have that control back to enjoy a glass or two, it's it's empowering. I, I loved it. Well, let me ask you, did you ever have this thing? I hit a point um, about a year ago or maybe six months ago or a year ago, I don't know, um, where my brain was going, okay, you need to drink more because I want this, I want this feeling that you used to get. It was like, it was, my brain was telling me to drink more because it wanted to get what it was, but yet I knew I couldn't. And finally it just gave up and went, it ain't going to happen. Wow. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. And I love the way you described it. And I think it's a common challenge that many people, myself included, experience on the treatment where that we call, you know, drinking through the medicine where they feel like they are pushing through the wall, the naltrexone wall that comes yes. to like, okay, I have that off switch. I've had enough, but they push through anyway, because the habit piece, or like you were describing, it's like your brain is looking for that euphoria that it's not going to get because now yes. it's blocking, but it's like, where is it? Like, yes. okay, maybe yeah. I need more, maybe I need. So tell me about your experience with that. Like, how did you navigate that? Because the challenge I commonly see is people power through it and drink through it and kind of can get stuck in a plateau where they're ignoring that naltrexone off switch and just letting the habit kick in or that desire for that, you know, familiar buzz. Well, I think um, a hangover in your fifties on naltrexone, that'll do it. <laughs> yeah. A couple of those and you're like, mm -mm, mama can't do this anymore. Yeah, it really is. That's a lot of it. And I think, you know, your body goes and you, and you can get to the point where you can stand outside and your body and say, do you want to be sick? Do you want to feel horrible tomorrow or do you want to stop now? And it, it, it takes a few times, but you know, it, but, but you know, your brain finally goes, it's not going to get, I can't get through it. I can't get through it. It's not going to happen. So it just kind of slowly, gradually with me, it just gave up. It gave up. And it's I think what, that's the beauty of the brain is it's very adaptable. And so if you train it that, Hey, you know, we're done at two drinks or whatever that number yeah. is, and you stop uh, you know, prevent it from like reaching for that buzz over time. Like you say, I love that you say it that way, you're just going to give up and you're going to become more in tune with and able to respond to that off switch. Because I often hear people say they notice it, but they blow past it. Um, they do. Mm -hmm. And you're just going to keep pushing. Well, another thing, if I would go out and just have like one drink and come home, I almost got a high off the fact that I only had one drink. I'm going to come home and I'm going to, I'm a real nerd. I'm going to read tonight or I'm going to do a crossword puzzle. That was my hobbies, you know? And so I'm thinking, okay, I don't care if I'm nerd out, but this, which I didn't do that because you can't work a crossword puzzle when you had too much drink when you could, but it, it, it's not good the next day when you look at it and go, yeah, you know, that type thing. So it's just, it, you almost, I would get like a rush off of being able to say it was controlled and I came home and I'm done and I can watch TV or I can, you know, whatever, just whatever. It was awesome. Yeah. I love that yeah. you said that. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, but I had to say this. This is really funny. Okay. We're like, I said, we're flying to Norfolk tomorrow yeah. for Christmas. I tell my husband, I said, all I want is, can you upgrade me to that purple card so I can get into the Delta sky room? I just want to see what it's like. So he's like, that's all you want for Christmas. I said, yeah. So he got one. I said, I got the Delta purple thing tomorrow night. We're going, and I think I'm going to have a glass of wine. He goes, oh, what's wrong with you? He said, he says, you need to get out more. You really, that's all you really want to do. I said, yeah, I'm a glass of wine tomorrow. I take my naltrexone and I'm going to go into with the purple card and say, I got it. Let me into Delta. <laughs> the Delta sky miles. <laughs> oh, the simple joys of life, right? I know. I know they have a bar there. They say it's real pretty, you know, and everything. So. That is yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yes, I know. Oh my gosh. It, it, you get to appreciate different things in life. Like you're talking about, like you get a high from being able to go home and watch TV or do a crossword. Like those are the things that when we're just focused on drinking and getting drunk, it, it really takes away from those things. And as we're on this treatment and seeing our brain become fixed, it's like these other things start to actually be more fun and we actually get a reward from them but exactly. i do think it it takes time because you were talking about the habit piece and how that's been difficult for you to break like i'm sure this wasn't just like you know an, an overnight transition where you're like oh i love to do crosswords instead I, I wonder if you wanted to talk about that actually like how has it been for you uh with the habit what are the challenges um you've had with changing the habits of, of drinking well you know i guess it was just basically i don't know i think i just with it's being conscious of what the habits are, you know, of the five o'clock, you know, pop the top, let's go type thing. Um, being aware of your situation and your surroundings. Okay, we're going to a party. You have to make sure that, um, you know, do count your drinks. Don't just let them just keep pouring, 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 that type thing. Um, 
I think that was probably the biggest thing with the habit. Once the medication took over, it kind of started unraveling it itself because my mind was not thinking about it all the time. Because when you think about it all the time, that, that, um, that's, that's your whole life. And I think another thing I had to do, and this may be a little bit off the habit thing, was learn not to beat myself up. Because I can sit here and think of all the hours I lost all the time being sick and not feeling well. And I, just, I can really just get down on myself. But the thing that is, that's in the past, and I've got to leave that. That's not who I am anymore, and I've got to let that go. And that's very, very hard to do sometimes. And I think, and then I'll get to say, was I a good mother? Oh, my gosh. Was that, you know, and the beating yourself up over the things. And that can, you know, that can really, really, that can put you back into those old habits again because you can get feeling down on yourself. And so what do you want to do? Well, it's to self-medicate. That's another one. you got to let that go. Let that, that go in the past and just let it go. And my kids said, yes, I was a good mother. At least my daughter did after she turned about 18. <laughs> Until then, she's, <laughs> until then, I think she pretty just didn't like me much. But anyway, I'm just Isn't kidding. that par for the course? <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. She and I are great now. She's 22 and my son's 26. And, you know, oh. she says, boy, I was a real stinker. I'm like, yeah, you were. It was just the mouth. I, both my kids are really good. I was very blessed. They were not, yes. they didn't do anything bad. They were just, they were kids, yeah. you know? That's it. So, and you know, my mother would even say, well, you don't have a problem. Just, just, this is the one. You don't have a problem. Just put it down. Just don't drink it. They don't understand. Right. It's habit and craving, habit and craving together. This is what I do. This is what I do. And you know what now? I don't pop. That's another thing. If your habit is popping a top at five to start cooking dinner, put it to the side. Don't start till six if you can. Put dinner off till six if you can. It's just those slow things of, you know, of slowly pushing it back, pushing it back, pushing it back and trade and, and you know, changing those things, yes. I guess, with the habit. I may be talking in circles here, but, you know, that's just, no. it's just a gradual over time and you can't, you can't. You can't just stop it all at once. You're not going to pull the Band-Aid off. It's yeah. a thing. You did not become this way overnight. You cannot undo it overnight. Exactly. And that's such a, a perfect example because I think that's a common challenge for people is that like it's so associated with like the evening unwinding and cooking dinner yes. and things like that. And for the first step is really becoming aware of the habit. You know, I think some people are surprised on the method how much they're drinking is habitual where they just don't even think about it. They walk in the door, they open the wine, they pull out their favorite glass. It's just this yes. whole ingrained ritual that even to change that, we have to think about it a bit like, okay, well, like you said, okay, maybe I can push it out an hour or maybe I exactly. can have it with dinner instead of before dinner, you know, all of these different strategies, but it doesn't need to be this massive change. Like it can be one little change week over exactly. week that you're doing to help um, this process along because I, I do see people get stuck in habitual drinking like we we're talking about where it's like exactly through the medicine well and the, the favorite glass that's a big one you brought that up several times before okay there's this one little glass that I love uh oh I lost you are you still there I'm still here okay I can't see you um oh, no. but anyway there's this one let me put my glasses on <laughs> <laughs> there's this one glass I absolutely love and you know what I do with it now is I actually um instead of um putting wine in it I put diet coke and it's, I, I know that sounds silly, but even something like that will make a big change. It really, really will. Honestly, yeah. And I, I did the same thing, Kristen, to where my favorite wine glass that I would pour wine into at five o'clock, I started putting a sparkling water with a lemon and not even saying I'm not going to drink. I would just be like, I'm going to have this first and then yes. I'll fill this with wine. And I noticed after about a month of that at five uh -huh. o'clock, my brain was like, I want sparkling water. And it same, would start exactly. to crazy. Same happened to you? Yeah, Exactly. It's awesome. It's so cool. Like we can see our brain change and when, especially when we're not fighting the craving as much and just trying yes. to resist the urge, it's like, no, I genuinely want a sparkling water and maybe I'll have wine later. Maybe not. Exactly. Exactly. I was curious to ask you, cause you were like kind of talking about how you were more of a gradual responder or slow responder. Can you share about what your like response was to the medication and maybe how you stayed encouraged or committed to it because sometimes people if they're not seeing results right away they can feel like it's not working or they can get discouraged I was just curious if you could talk about like your journey of what you saw as your drinking was changing well the first month really I didn't see much going on but um I think the biggest thing for me was I actually ran across your your videos on YouTube and I thought oh Katie that's my daughter's name I'm gonna watch this yeah and that's when you you were just um you know and I'm like Oh my gosh. Okay. This, but my thing was, I kept thinking, okay, I see that this is working for other people. You would post things about other people and about yourself and where you came from and how it can't, you know, it happened. And I would just keep going back to that and thinking, okay, this works. This works. Tell yourself, this is going to work. This is going to work. 80%. Well, now they're saying, what was the other day you posted 93%. I was up there doing a dance, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, yes, it can work. It can work. And if you read the scientific background to it, and to me, it's like, you know, 
you see the numbers, you see the scientific backing to this. Therefore, you know, th this is not just something that somebody just threw out there. This has been proven. Um, and if you can hang on to that in your brain, even though if you're a slow responder, you don't see it, you're going to start seeing the little things like, oh, I had an alcohol free day. Oh, I had two. Oh my gosh. Um, I went to a party this weekend and I, I knew I was going to go to a party and I decided I'm going to only have X amount of drinks. And that's what I stuck to. Um, like the weekend, because that was a big turning point when I was going to my daughter's last March, I was really starting to see things. And that's when I talked to you and you said, you know, in between each drink, have something like a, a Coke or a Diet Coke or water. And that one, when I went back the next morning, in fact, at one thirty in the morning, my daughter calls, she goes, we can't get an Uber back to the, um, back to the, back to campus. And I said, okay, no problem. So I'm in my pajamas. I just throw my head on. And I thought, if this had been a year ago, I couldn't have driven them anywhere. And, you know, I, I wouldn't even have thought, I would have said, uh, I'll come stand with you until you get the Uber, but I can't take you, you know, that type thing. It was the little things like that. When you start seeing those little bitty things that show up, that's your hope. Hold on to that because it's the little bitty things here and there and there and over time and over time. It's like losing weight. You're not going to lose 10 pounds in one day. You're going to lose a pound here, a couple pounds here, but eventually you're going to lose that 20 pounds or that 25 pounds that you want to lose, but it's not going to happen overnight. Yeah. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. No, I think what you brought up too about noticing the little things, because I think for most, I've talked to a lot of people over the years, and I think for most people, that's how the method works is these subtle changes that maybe we mm -hmm. can dismiss is like, no, oh, maybe that was a placebo or maybe that was just a coincidence. But yes. it's like, these are the things that really add up to the bigger changes over time. And I think the weight loss analogy is a perfect comparison to that. I'm working on that next. What's there no <laughs> saying that says you can't quit drinking and smoking at the same time? Well, you can't quit drinking and lose weight at the same time. But, you know, it is a lot easier. <laughs> I know, without all the alcohol calories. But I, I used yeah. food as a coping tool, to be honest. Like, that was my step down from alcohol. So I was like, I'm go. not even going to think about that. But, yeah, it comes exactly. with time. One thing I know. at a time. I know. Mine's TJ Maxx. I do love going to TJ Maxx. <laughs> Occasionally, I have to get a little fix there, you know. Yeah. But hey, if you get the credit card, you get the ten dollar gift certificate every so often. So hey, they it's a win-win. Yeah. Win. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. So okay, I wanted to ask you because you mentioned when you started drinking, it was more of like a coping tool. Was it difficult for you to find other coping tools, or you know, what was that like navigating this and not relying on alcohol as the number one go-to? Um, prayer is a big one. Yeah. Um, and sometimes this, instead of just flying off and losing it or just, you know, I wouldn't like scream or yell at anybody, but when it just got too much, my brain would just go, I just, it's a matter of walking into the other room and breathing. And I think sometimes we just get so caught up in it. We think, okay, we can't just step back from this for two seconds. I've just got to deal with it right now and get in there, you know, the whole bit and everything. But I think it's just, it's walking off from it. Um, mine's prayer. Um, mine is Lord, help me not to lose my mind right now. Um, help me not to hurt somebody right now. <laughs> you know, um, I wouldn't look good in orange and behind bars. So, you know, um, it just, it's just a little, it's, it's that I was, um, yeah. Um, it's not easy sometimes because you do have to, and that's another thing you have to learn to deal with reality. You're back in reality again, and you're not living in that numb world. And, you know, life is not easy. It's not easy at all. Um, I had, I had a dog of mine I had to put down two weeks ago that I was just, I'm in love with him, my baby. And, you know, I thought if this had been a couple of years ago, I probably would have drank, you know, after I buried him or while I was burying him. But, you know, I didn't this time. I realized I sat, stood there and I thought of all the, the, the wonderful times I had with him, the sweet baby he was. And, you know, I, I actually could feel again, if that makes sense. That's another thing. You get to where you can feel again. Um, so, you know, getting out of that habit, it's just, it's just one day at a time and that type thing. And the coping mechanisms, you learn other ones. You know, if you can't do this, you know, you learn how to do something else. You really do. Because you realize going back to what you have is not working. It was just not working for you or anybody else, especially for you. Yeah, it's so true. And there's, it, it's not the easiest journey to learn how to feel, especially those uncomfortable emotions, which we're used to numbing out with alcohol. But I think yeah. there's, it's so rich to be able to feel again. There's a quote I always reference by Brene Brown, where she says, you cannot selectively numb emotions. When you numb the negative ones, you also numb the positive ones. And oh, that's good. I, I really felt like alcohol blocked me of feeling genuine joy. Like I started Bingo. to feel that again through naltrexone and TSM as I was drinking less. I was like, 
I wasn't like I'd be momentarily happy and buzzed and stuff, but like that pure joy of just being at peace because you know you're alive and you're grateful for that. Like I really Bingo. felt that with alcohol. Exactly. Use. Do you, you know, know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, exactly. You go. Oh, look how pretty the sun is. And, oh, it's so pretty today, and the flowers smell good. And oh, the grass is turning green. And you know stuff like that where you you know if you felt horrible or you felt nasty or you had too much, you didn't see it. You go, mm -hmm. oh yeah, that's pretty. You yeah. know, I kind of go home I and take a nap now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> it's like, I need a big nap. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. I know. Yeah. It's incredible though, to because it, yeah, alcohol use disorder, I just feel like it kept me in a little box and it was like a self serving thing where I was just constantly living for that next drink and to get free from it gradually and get glimpses into this life where, you know, you're not uh, wrapped to it like a ball and chain and you still exactly. have the option to drink. It's just, it's pretty incredible, this treatment. Obviously, I'm a huge fan of it, right? Exactly. Well, me too. Well, you can edit this part if you want to, so people won't think I'm totally nuts. Um, <laughs> but um, I remember when I first started back a second time, I was about three months in and I'd had one evening where I drank too much and I was getting ready to get ready to go. And I thought, I'm never saying, Lord, is this going to work? And I swear it's plain as day. It said, this will work. It was like this voice just came into my head and I went, okay, now I'm schizophrenic <laughs> you know, on top of everything oh, else. But it was just, and that is what I had moved forward with because it's like something just came in my head and said, this will work. And I thought, this is it. Okay. You gave it to me. Let's go with it. You know, that's all you can do. Oh, all you can do. It's you know, so it crazy you said that because our coach Samara, I don't know if you're aware of her, but she did TSM and then kind of fell off as well. And her uh -huh. second time around when she was in prayer looking for an answer, what she heard was do TSM again. Like that's what God had spoken to her. So I think her. that's a really powerful testimony. Um, exactly. Yeah. It's, I, I think just such an obvious answer to prayer for people. And it now, is. you know, who knows how many people, you know, you'll influence even just by this interview or people you tell in your personal life, like it's just a, a life-changing treatment. It is. It really is. And I just, I just, I wish, you know, if there, I just wish it was better known. Yeah. I wish it was better known. And I mean, yeah, there are some people that are so, you know, they need to detox in a hospital because it's so bad. It would be safe, not un unsafe not to do that. It wouldn't be safe. But, you know, there are those people that, that, that this is their only hope and this will work. It will work. You know, yeah. it's no one is hopeless. No one is hopeless. And, you know, this, you know, ADU, um, yeah, alcohol use, AUD, it does not, mm -hmm. it doesn't, um, what am I trying to say? It doesn't, it doesn't matter who you are socioeconomically, educational wise race, color, creed, it doesn't matter, religion, whatever, it does, it can affect anyone. The stigma that's been put on this is just, it, you know, it's like, oh, you know, that's the person that's laying in the gutter type person. It's not, it's everybody from the housewife to the neurosurgeon to the, you know, to the, you know, I don't know, sports athlete person or whatever. There's, it does not discriminate on anyone. It doesn't. And it's, you know, it's no different than like Bruce says, he's epileptic. He takes medication for that, you know? I got an issue with this. I take, I take allergy medication for my allergies. Yeah. My, you know, that type thing. It's just, it, but it, it works. It works. If you work it, it really does. Absolutely. And you're so right. It does not discriminate. And I think there's such a stigma around it where, you know, especially someone who maybe is really successful in life and they battle with it. Like they almost want to keep it more of a secret because they're like, well, I, I shouldn't have this problem, you know, but it really, I've seen every person in every industry, Yep. Even Karen, my co-founder at Thrive, she was literally an addiction counselor and struggling with her own alcohol wow. addiction and wow. before she found TSM. And she left the field because she was like, I feel so bad that I'm like helping others with this when I can't even help myself. And so yes. this tool is just, yeah, it can work for most people out there. It's just incredible. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask you, as we kind of start to wrap up, like, uh -huh. what were some of the challenges you had? If you could say, like, I know compliance was one of them, but like, if you can think about some of the hardest things you went through on the Sinclair Method, what what were they? Um, I think um, the guilt of thinking, um, you know, the next day when I did drink too much, when I just first started um, and thinking, okay, this is just going to be me for the rest of my life. I should just quit. You know, I'm just going to have an alcohol problem and for the rest of my life and just try to hide it from everybody. That was one, I think, get down on yourself. Don't get down on yourself. Um, impatience is a big one. You know, we're in a society where we want it yesterday, if you can, type situation. And, you know, a lot of people think, take a pill, it should just go away like that. It's not. Um, you know, you've got to put the work in. You've got to put the time in. That's a big one. Um, I think it's not getting down on yourself, um, forgiving yourself. Um, you're not a bad person because this happened. Um, it's, you're not flawed because this happened. 
uh, it's just something that happened and it can be taken care of. It can be fixed if you want to put it, I guess, fixed or however you want to say. Uh, it can be, you know, under control. You can choose to either not drink at all. You can choose to, you know, have something occasionally, whatever you want to do. Um, don't be ashamed of yourself. Um, I really, I was so afraid that people would find out. But, you know, when I told my friends, they're like, okay, we never knew it, but we're glad you're doing something about it. And, you know, maybe you can talk to a friend of mine that needs help with this, that type thing. So that's, that's probably the, you know, the thing that you have to stick to is that, you know, those are the hurdles. Just, I think just beating yourself up, you know, that realize, you just got to realize that was you in the past. This is a new you. You got to move forward with it and it's going to get better. It will. It will get better. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. Really good advice. That's it's so easy, I think, to get down on ourselves because when we have alcohol use disorder, it's like just comes with the territory, like the negative thinking, the self-sabotage, beating ourselves up. And for me, I really had to train my brain to stop being a, mean to myself. It was like, exactly. geez, I'm so mean to myself. Like, exactly. how do I? But it's a habit too, the thoughts we think. So I'm, I'm really happy that you mentioned that. Well, you know, I joke about living in the South, but I mean, I kid you not, if, not, if you go to a baby shower, they will have alcohol there. Yeah. I went to a funeral. It was over by 11. They had a full bar. Oh my gosh. I don't like going, oh my gosh. You know, it is, it's, it's a very social, very alcohol um, prominent, you know, in society down here. That's yeah. just, you know, you have a, your four o'clock cocktail and cocktail and, you know, you just go on and that's how it is or five o'clock cocktail. And it's just, you know, everywhere you go, it's in your face type thing. So, mm -hmm. you know, you get to the point where like, Oh, I saw such and such downtown last night at the bar. Did you see him? I don't know how he even got home, you know, that type thing, but you know, they laugh about it, but it's serious. Yeah. It's serious. You know, it really yeah. is. Yeah. And because yeah. it's so socially accepted like that, I remember for me, I was like, do I have a problem or is just, just how everyone drinks and mm -hmm. this real internal conflict, but we know like, I think that's the thing with AUD. It's like, nobody's going to tell you if you have a problem, it's up to you to decide. And exactly, you know, cause I think, you know, we, ha we have to make that decision for ourselves. Obviously we have to want to do this treatment for ourselves. Well, would you get mad if someone had ever said anything to you? Like, you know, well, I think you have a problem. Cause my husband would say, well, I think you got an issue. You need to like, just stop drinking. And I get like, excuse me, Super. Defensive. I know where you sleep at night. I can keep yeah. you down, yeah. you know, really? You know, and I get mad and I would tell him, no, you need to read about the Sinclair method. You need to read about it. Cause um, he, now my husband has kind of a science background. So, I mean, this would be right up his alley I and mean, he's read about it, but I don't think he fully understands it, mm -hmm. but you know, I would get just so mad at him. Oh my gosh. It just, I'm like, what do you mean? Yeah. I know I got a problem, but you can't tell me I do. You yeah. know, did you ever get like that? Oh yeah. It's like, if someone's like, Hey, you need to lose 10 pounds. You'd be like, what? <laughs> exactly. None yeah. of your business. Yeah. <laughs> it's one thing. Yeah. We need to do it for ourselves. Cause we yeah, do. it's not, yeah. You know, even when people like I get husbands, wives, moms, dads reaching out to me like, Oh, I want my spouse to do this or my kid to do this. And I'm always like, do they want to do it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, we're they not, have to. I need to talk to them because That's it's it. not going to want it. Yeah. And I wanted it even though, and I wanted to be a better mother. I wanted to be a better wife. I wanted to be a better daughter. Um, cause my mom, she lives, she moved down here about seven years ago and she lives literally two minutes away from me and, you know, me getting upset with something she said or done because she's 81 and I've got to realize that when she sometimes jumps about something, it's, it's not that she's mad at me. It's it could be fear or just, you know, she didn't quite understand what I was saying. And, you know, I'd be really mad and go home and just right over that. And you gotta, I have to let that go, but I'm, I'm a better daughter for it. I'm a better mother. I'm a better, you know, you know. I think why for it? Because I just, instead of just, you know, lashing back at Todd when I was, you know, mm -hmm. after I'd had too much drink, I could just kind of, okay, let's discuss this, you know, yeah. that type thing. Yeah. 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 You become a more whole version of yourself and when you're not dependent on that crutch anymore and it's not mm -hmm. impacting your mental clarity and your emotional state, it's just nothing can replace that feeling of like trusting yourself again and knowing Bingo. you can get through difficult mm -hmm. situations without needing a glass of wine. It's so freeing. It really is. Um, yeah. So I know, okay. Like, I think this might be my final question. Um, okay. You are, you've been on the Sinclair method a couple years, a second go around. I understand. So what's yes. your relationship with alcohol like today? Like, what is it? What does it look like? Does it feel peaceful? How, how does it feel? It does. It feels peaceful. Um, you know, I can just, I just, not one of those things that I think about every day. Like I said, I can sit down and realize, oh my gosh, it's 8 30 at night. And you know, if this has been a year ago, I've been going, oh my gosh, I've already been, I, you know, I didn't even do a drink or, you know, that type thing, or it was five o'clock and I want to have something to drink. You know, I did, it's freeing. 
Yeah. Um, like I said, the thing I'm working on now is when we go out like in a social situation of really watching and being aware of how much I do have to drink when I'm in a social situation, because it's very easy to get to talking, get to laughing, having a good time. And, you know, they poured you a glass of wine. Well, you didn't realize that someone else poured you a glass of wine. And next thing you know, it's like, oh, my gosh, you know, I had too much to drink and I just don't like the way I feel the next day. That's what I'm working on now is, is really the mindfulness when I'm out, that type thing. But at home, I don't even think, I, well, I think we do have one glass of, I think we do have one bottle of wine downstairs that's white, but it's when we're saving for something that's really nice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here's another thing. My mom is taking me and my brother and my sister-in-law on a cruise in two weeks. It's free open bar. Had that been two years ago, holy cow, yeah. it would not have been good. But now I know I can go and I'll be up the next morning. Where are we going today? What are we going to do today? Are we going to play bingo? Are we going to, you know do Zumba or what are we, what are we going to do? We're going to go to the beach. Whereas if that had been before open bar had been just like, Oh, that would have been so bad. Yes. You know, that's just a death sentence for, you know, hungover every day. So yes. it, 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 that's what, yeah, that's our relationship. I think it's more freedom I have right now, especially during, you know, during the week of knowing that I don't, you know, it's just one of those things I don't do during the week and on the weekend, if we want to go out to dinner or whatever, I have the option. Yeah. I have the option. Yes. And I so relate to that, the social drinking. It's interesting because some people I meet, they'll struggle with drinking at home. That'll be their more difficult part on TSM. Mm -hmm. But after a while, I mastered that. But when I'd be social, because I have a bit of social anxiety anyway, so I would like be drinking and kind of lose track of time and things like that. And it was easy for me to plow through the Naltrex zone yes. in social settings. So I just relate to that challenge. How long did that go on for you? Do you know about Probably about the last six months of my TSM okay. journey, I would say, because I was on it for a year and I think, yeah, I, I, by, yeah, about the six month mark, I was doing pretty well, like drinking moderately, but I could still out when I was drinking out socially, it would be, um, yes. yeah, yeah, unless I was mindful, I could drink beyond it. For yes, sure. exactly. Yeah. And that's where I am now. So, you know, and that's just what, that's what I'm working on now. But I, yeah. I mean, the freedom is just unbelievable. Yeah. But yeah. like those simple tools of just like, okay, I'm going to have a water between each one. Like those, it's not like you have mm -hmm. to do anything massive. It's just like, oh, those things can take you a long way in those environments. At least that was true for me. Exactly. Well, of course, we, of course, like when I told you I was going to my daughter, it's all the college bars. Yeah. I told my husband, I said, these are the same bars we used to crawl through when we were like in our twenties. And you know, because we went to the same school our daughter goes to. And I said, did they smell this bad? And were the floors this sticky? And he goes, yeah, I think they were. I'm like, oh my gosh, don't touch anything in here. I've got wet wipes here, kids. Use the wet wipes. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is totally, you know, go total mom on them. Oh Whereas my gosh. before we've been like, okay, here's the next drink. And I even had some of the kids, I say kids are grown adults. Hey, this, this Christmas, you want me to get you a shot? And I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. And I mean, normally before that would have been like, yeah, bring it on you know, type thing. So it's just amazing the control that it gives you. Yeah. Yes. You know, and it, yeah. And it's okay to say to yourself, you know what? I did good today. I really did. It's okay to say I did a good job with this. You know, I didn't mess up or not mess up, but I didn't go ahead and drink today. And it's okay to tell yourself, yeah, you did a really good job today. And that's not, you know, what am I trying to say? Um, trying to inflate your ego or anything. It's just it's saying, yeah, I got through another day because of this method. And oh give yourself, gosh, yes. give yourself that gratitude. Do it, do it, give it to yourself. Yes, honestly, because the alcohol use disorder, like we were saying, it can just tear you down mentally, physically, emotionally. It, it just can yep. be this burden. And mm -hmm. if you're not building yourself up, being, I tell people, be your own inner coach. Because if you watch those thoughts, you'll see how quickly it's and how easy you can just beat yourself up and be mean. But I think, yeah, building yourself up, giving yourself kudos like in our program every Saturday we invite people to share their small win just so they're focusing on that week what went awesome. well maybe it was a disaster but what's the one thing that one went thing that went well, well. You know? exactly yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't leave my kids standing on the side of the road because I couldn't take them anymore you know? yes I mean like that's that. life-changing honestly because you look back you're like wow that's yeah yeah I handled it the right way exactly yeah. I know yeah that's so yeah. cool Okay, Kristen, is there anything else that I didn't ask you or that, you know, final words you want to share with people before we wrap up the conversation? No, I just want to thank you for all that you've done. Like I said, it was a fluke. I found this. It was a fluke. I found you because you have the same name as my daughter. And, you know, and I started watching the videos before you even started the Thrive. And then I found the, um, do go to the Zoom meetings if you can. It's what I, I would tell people because you see there are the people your age. You're, um, you know, same things. They'll say the same things that you go, oh my gosh, that's exactly what I was thinking. It's not just you. Use the sources that are out there because there are so many right now. Yeah. Um, it's insane. All the stuff you can get from the internet, the, um, the interviews, the, the coaching, the whatever you need, go out there and get it because it is. It's not a weakness to say that I need help. 
Um, and sometimes you can't do it all by yourself. You need to see that video or somebody else that says the exact same thing you're feeling or gives you that one little thing about like, you know, the pretty glass that makes it look so nice. Well, put the Diet Pepsi in instead of the, or put the sparkling water in it instead of the wine. Just the little things like that. Hold on to them, write them down. Track your drinks, track your drinks, track your drinks. I have a folder I take with me everywhere. My husband's like, what are all these numbers? I'm like, none of your business. <laughs> you know, what does AF mean? None of your business. You know, it, it, keep it with you. If you travel, it goes with you, If it, wherever. But track it because when you see the, you know, the hard facts right there, you'll know it works. Yeah. yeah. The, the tracking is tracking big. Yes. I, and that's something I honestly didn't do great at. And looking back, I so wish I had like that detailed log because I have periods of time missing and I wasn't consistent with it. And so that's always something like if I could go back and redo my TSM journey, I would be religious about that because yep. I want to see the nuances and the ups and downs and all of that. But yeah. And, and I agree that asking for help, we were just in a live group call this week and a gal was talking about how she was doing it on her own. And she's a therapist and she's like, I was just going to figure it out on myself and, or do it by myself. But like asking for help, it was like a humbling experience. And yes. I relate to that because I started TSM and was also going to do it alone. And a few months in realized I actually needed more outside support because of, you know, just my life changes that needed to happen. So I love exactly. that you said it's not a weakness to ask for help. Honestly, no. it's a strength because it requires you to be vulnerable. And in order to be vulnerable, there has to be courage under that. So exactly. I well, agree. and you know, when you get a counselor, they have no emotional attachment to you. Whereas your family will say, oh, it's going to be okay. What can I do for you? Your counselor will look at you and go, I remember she said, don't try to, you know, sugarcoat it because I will knock right through that. What is this that's causing you to drink? What is it that's upsetting you? What is, I mean, and digging that apart, it can be painful sometimes yeah. because sometimes you can carry stuff baggage with you and you've got to just unpack that bag and leave it back there. Yeah. You know, it's, of course, I used to have a joke and say, I have, I may have baggage, but at least it's a matching set, you know, <laughs> but I don't think it's a matching set anymore. <laughs> it's just, but you know, that's it. It's, it's sometimes you just have to have somebody outside your comfort zone or your family that'll tell you, this is what it is. And we're going to work on this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, just so well said, there's so much more I could say there, but yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you for saying that. No, but everything and you do, I thank you. For, it's wonderful. The stuff you do keep doing it. You know, the more we get the message and you get the message out, the Instagram, the whatever, you know, I, I said, amen, I'll get that back to you, you know, or something <laughs> yeah. like that, or, you know, that type of stuff. It's just, it, and you know, you don't know somebody flipping through Instagram because I, I know big brother is watching because I can talk right. about something crazy and I'll show up. So, you know, someone may be talking to somebody about an issue and your thing may just all of a sudden pop up on their thread. Who knows? Mm -hmm. It might be the one thing that saves them. Yes. You don't know. You don't it's know. It's so true. I know. Options. Yes. And it's, it's how we reach people now, because if they go to their doctor, probably, you know, 9.9 .9 out of 10 times, the doctor is going to say, go to AA or rehab just because there's not enough yep. knowledge out there yet. I've been to those conferences and seen what they offer to people. So yeah, I'm on fire gratefully to spread the word. And I really am grateful to you for being willing to share your story because these, I know this will have, you know, impact for years to come. And I know it's going to reach people and impact people um, who can relate to you and relate to everything you've gone through as a, a mother and someone who struggled yep. with secret drinking and, you know, the challenges you had on DSM. I just thank you so much for being willing to share your story with us. Well, you're, you're welcome. And one thing I want to say just real quick about the doctor. I do have a wonderful doctor. When I went to go see her, I was already on this. So I ran off all the information about it, copied it. Um, I even, um, this time when I started back up again, I gave them your website, um, your name. I gave them a photocopy of the front of the book of the Cure for Alcoholism. And I said, here, this is not something that's just, you know, fly by night thing. This, this is real. This works. And she said, okay. And she's actually started using it with her patients. So if you have a doctor that says, you know, take the stuff to him, say, look, okay, if you're saying no, just give me two minutes, take this home tonight and read it. And then maybe we can discuss me going on this because I really think this might be my, my best bet or my last hope. Yeah. You know, given the websites, given the places to go to, you know, yours, the, the Zoom meetings, the, the links, whatever. And it's amazing how a doctor who would normally say, yeah, right, because they haven't heard of it, can sit down and go, oh, my gosh, this works. Yes. This might actually work because it's scientifically proven. Okay. And I'll, I'll get off my soapbox on that. No, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like chomping at the bit now, too, because this is how we are going to get the snowball effect with the Sinclair yes. method because two of the major Sinclair method providers who are telemedicine doctors online now uh -huh. learned about it from one patient. 
who yes. told them and advocated for themselves and sent them the information and the doctors were willing to learn about it. And now they've treated thousands of people with this treatment. Bingo. And so Bingo. for you, if yeah, like you said, if you have a doctor you're friendly with and you want to take this, or even if it's a new doctor, I don't know, but some doctors will just not want to hear it. But there are a lot of doctors that are willing to listen. And by you help bringing that information the one time, they could impact countless lives ahead of, exactly. ahead of you. So, so awful. absolutely, like that is how we are going to have this grassroots effort to bring this method to the mainstream. It's going to exactly. be one person at a time and do not underestimate the impact that one person can have. Just like your example is perfect. Like now you have changed other people's lives because you fought for your own uh, I hope. You know, recovery. I, hope. TSM. I just hope. Yeah. yeah. Because it's that's something, there is hope. There is hope. There's hope no matter what. Nothing is beyond hope. Yeah. yeah. No one is beyond hope. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And even, I mean, like you, you did it, it worked, but then you fell off and it's like, Hey, you can restart it again. And there we yep. go. Like, it's not I like will never go off of it again. Yeah. That's me. Learned that lesson. Yeah. Learn that lesson. <laughs> Bad girl. Okay. <laughs> go to your room <laughs> and don't take a bottle of wine with you. <laughs> yeah. No wine tonight. <laughs> no wine tonight. <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you so much, Kristen. I genuinely enjoyed this conversation so, so much. And thank you everyone for listening. If you have questions or comments about this video, please put them uh, beneath the video. And Kristen, I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you, Katie. Longest and subs. <laughs> Bye.